my name is Lois Barnes. I work for the Southern Regional Education Board, or I used to. Um, well, I still do, but, but now I'm uh, uh, an independent contractor with them. I retired last year from SREB as a full-time employee. Um, uh, I, uh, except that nobody ever retires from SREB. Um, you just, it's like Douglas MacArthur and old soldiers, you know, you just kind of uh, keep working until you kind of fade away, you know. So um, I'm very pleased that uh, SREB asked me to keep working in Pennsylvania in particular because I love coming uh, to this state and working with uh, the folks here. Uh, my facilitator is Dick Steinmeier, who is back here. Uh, do the, the, the Beauty Queen wave. So that, um, so that when you have the evaluations and stuff like that, he'll have at the end, um, please, for, for um, my feedback. And he is also, just to tell you our role together, Dick is the state coordinator for high schools that work, which is the, um, one of the school improvement initiatives of the Southern Regional Education Board. So let's, let's move right in. Uh, what are we going to do in the next hour? We're going to move fast. Um, there are some things in the, the handout, I'll warn you right now, are in there as um, sponge activities that I, there's one that I probably won't even get to, but, uh, but we will move through as quickly as we can without moving too fast that you don't get anything out of it, all right? So uh, I've got a couple of objectives for us in the next hour. Um, the first objective for us is that I hope that you will identify something, some sort of strategy, this is a strategy session, that is new to you that you will commit to trying next week when you go back to school, okay? A formative assessment strategy. And uh, if we have time, then we'll work on the second objective, uh, the feedback and redo strategies. We will look at some redo strategies. Um, I, I hope we'll have time to look at a little bit of feedback strategies too. Um, they are in your handout. Now, let me say right now, what's mine is yours. Um, the handout is yours. Um, if you're a visual learner like I am and, um, and you think you have to write down everything, yeah, look at you. Um, look at her. Oh, it's, it's, it's such a learning disability, isn't it? Um, she's writing down everything I'm saying already, and I haven't even started. Um, um, if you're a real visual learner and you've got that little Rolodex brain, you know, where you have to, to type every word that's being said or write it, write it do your best. But the, what's mine is yours. You will have the PowerPoint. Um, and you will also have the handout if you ask me for them. And, all right, so um, those are our objectives for the day. Now we're going to start off with a one minute writer. There's 1,442 minutes in one day. We're going to use one of them today for writing. So everybody got a, a pen or pencil out? I'm going to ask you to respond to one of these two questions, just one of them. How do you, when do you assess and why do you assess, one or the other? When do you assess students or why do you assess students? Are we ready? I'm going to set the timer on you. One minute. We ready? Shake or nod? Yes. yes. Okay, stop. Now, turn to your elbow partner. Make a new friend if you don't know your elbow partner. If you need to t look behind you, in front of you, if it needs to be a triad, that's fine. Share your response with uh, a new friend. So um, who answered the first question, when do you assess? About half of you. Okay, what did you or your partner say? What did you all talk about? I said um, formative assessments um, that are at the end of the unit, middle of the year, end of the year, and then informal assessments are periodically throughout the lesson. So you're talking about formative like benchmark assessments, okay? All right, what else did somebody else have? Yes, sir. I said throughout the lesson, you're assessing both pre, uh, during, and post uh, lesson. Okay, and your partner was nodding, and Pat's nodding back there, and she said pretty much the same thing, I think, and uh, yes. What else? Yeah. When I use questioning, based on their participation back, if they're responding back, or if it's not just silence, Okay, all right, good. Well, um, thank you for that. Yeah. The only other thing I've said is continuously, we're always assessing. We should always be listening and watching. All right, y'all are making my session so easy. <laughs> all right, any other wins that you want to share? All right, those of you that said, why do you assess? What did you say? Where are you? Right, let me see you. Commit to me. All right. Why do you assess? Thank you. Why do you assess? One is companies really comprehend the material and also the effects. OK. 
Okay, Pat? I said we assess to see if kids learn and can apply what we have taught, and if not, we can reteach. We can measure growth over time. Okay, thank you for that. Others? Otherwise? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes you assess before you even start teaching, just to find out where your where your starting point should be. Oh, oh, you all are just making my hour so easy. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. When you see slides that I zip by, okay, know that you can have them later to read or to share with others, but there's no point in me covering it because you've already said it. All right. Remember that. Greg's already said one of my slides. All right. Any others? Delaware Valley, what'd you say? Pick on you. We were discussing whether to give the, the honest answer or the right answer. <laughs> I want the honest answer. I want the candid answer. I know you're always honest, but I want the candid answer. Yeah, we assess to find out what students learn about a given period of time, whether it's a unit, a question, anything. No, thank you for that. That's, a, a, that's very helpful to, to what I'm going to be covering. You know, in, in today's education world, you have to quantify it. You have to give grades. So you have to assess to be able to grade, to give grades. Okay. Okay. You're, you're uh, uh, all are correct. And, um, and just because, it, you know, you think it's not the right answer, it actually is, of course. What you're talking about is different than what I'm going to spend most of the rest of this hour on, which is formative assessment. You're talking about summative assessment. So traditionally, um, yes, teachers assess at the end of a unit, they, uh, at the end of a certain um, sequence of instruction. Um, but when you ass interweave assessment and instruction, then it's very, very powerful. Students and teachers benefit. So what you all have said in all of this is referring to both types of assessment. What Brian at Delaware Valley is talking about, what we're talking about here is, um, assessment, is summative assessment. It's what happens at the end of a certain part of learning um, to see what students have learned and to assign a grade, perhaps. Um, and then the formative, which is what we're really spending most of this hour on, is the assessment for learning. How can we use the information uh, in order to improve teaching and learning so students um, achieve more? Um, again, the um, summative assessment is to assign grades and to evaluate what a student has learned. Formative assessment happens while learning is still taking place, um, and it's to help you to plan your next steps, to diagnose, to step backwards, as, as uh, we said up here on the front row, um, what you need to do to adjust your instruction so that all students learn. Now, this is where we'll, it gets a little dicey with audiences. Formative assessment supports the learning process, and the grading function should be set aside. But I'm hearing, you know, you all admit that accountability is part of, of, uh, of, of uh, assessment also. And we'll talk about that a little bit, how we can do uh, a little less of the grading and more of the formative assessment without the grading. Now, I'm, let, me, let me chase that rabbit one more minute. It's probably going to be on a slide here later on. Assess a lot, grade a little. Assess a lot grade a little. If that's the only thing you take out of here from an hour's worth of, of you talking to each other and, and us talking together, that's the piece I want you to remember. Okay. Assess a lot, grade a little. Because it's not, formative assessment's not about accountability. It's about helping students to improve their work. Now I'm, I'm going to chase that rabbit one more time. One more thing I'm going to say here that I hope to carry out while I'm thinking about it. If you put a grade on a paper, and you write all over it, all your wonderful descriptive feedback, specific feedback, all over that paper, you have wasted your time. No grade has ever increased achievement. Effective feedback increases achievement. Formative assessment that includes effective feedback where um, students can recognize what they need to do to get better, work on it to get better so that they can make that better grade at the end, that raises achievement. Formative assessment raises achievement. Putting a grade on a paper, um, has no, there's no research to support that a grade 
improves achievement. Okay? So, all right, let's move on. Let me show you two t typical definitions of formative assessment, and I've highlighted one word that's in each of them, feedback. Giving students feedback and teachers feedback. When we, you're talking about um, uh, diagnosing all throughout a lesson, giving feedback continuously during a lesson. I heard that word continuous two or three times. Um, when you're doing that, what you're doing is you're making those instantaneous decisions uh, based on the feedback students are giving you, okay? So you're getting feedback, they're getting feedback. It's not just giving it the feedback effectively, it's also getting feedback for yourself with formative assessment. Formative assessment, there's still time for students to take some action. There's still time for them to do something to improve their performance, to improve their knowledge and skills. Um, feedback from a summative assessment um, can be used as formative assessment, um, but you're going to have to use that yourself and, as you start the next unit. Okay, we all say, well, yeah, but isn't the summative assessment feed, uh, formative also if I use it to plan my next unit or to help the kids that didn't get it? Yes, of course. I'm going to, in the next um, 45 minutes, what we're going to talk about, though, is that continuous kind of assessment um, that you all are talking about. In particular, I'm going to um, focus on some strategies for checking for understanding that goes on continually during a lesson, all right? Those are the tip, kind of tips I'm going to give you in the next 45 minutes. All right, let's move on. Um, I heard somebody talk about benchmarks. Standardized tests are not the only way that we do formative assessment. And the most powerful forms of assessment take place day to day. You have the power, you have the control in the classroom to make a difference in students' achievement. Um, high quality formative assessment is what increases students' achievement. Now Black and William in 1998 did a meta-analysis of 250 studies and they found from their meta-analysis, their research on research, that um, effective formative assessment, particularly questioning, they focused on questioning and feedback, I think, but effective formative assessment will actually raise uh, achievement on your standardized test, up to uh, three or four points on the ACT, up to 70 to 100 SAT points, and, and essentially two grade equivalents. So it's really important that, and what they also found, which I think is key, is that it narrowed the achievement gap between the, the lowest achieving and the highest achieving, and it had the most impact on the low achievers, okay? It helps the kids who are performing the, the worst, if you will, um, when you give effective formative uh, assessment. Okay, so what do you need to do to, to do that? Um, you need to increase your descriptive feedback. None of this good job stuff. Good job doesn't tell anybody anything, okay? Um, and you need to increase student involvement in their own assessment process, and that's what we're going to look at. All right. Why does it work? Um, make sure it's focused on standards. All right, I've already covered that. I'm going to move on. All right, I'm going to stop right there. I've, I've talked for like five or seven whole minutes here. Wow, that's a long time for me. So I want you to take your index card and I want you to put an exclamation point on one side and a question mark on the other. Now write legibly because somebody else is going to read your card. And I want you on the exclamation point side to write me something that we've said here, you or I have said in the last um, 10 minutes that is an aha for you, that's uh, new learning for you, that is a, oh yeah, I, for, I used to know that and I've forgotten it, I really don't do it anymore. Some kind of aha, some kind of new learning, some, something that you've just had reinforced for you here in the last 10 minutes. On the question mark side, I want you to write a question you have, or an argument you have with me, um, on the question mark side. Take about a minute. Two minutes. All right, now you've got 15 seconds. That's a long time. 15 seconds. I want you to stand up and I want you to pass cards around as many times as you can so that you do not wind up with your own card. All right, now you've read your new card, I hope, at this point. Now, there's no threat. It's not threatening. You're not asking your own question. You're not giving your own um, positive. Uh, it's somebody else's that you don't even know, so it's okay. Tell me something that somebody has learned. Share out with me. Popcorn. Yes. The importance of formative assessment according to research. Ah, good. The importance according to research. Praises student achievement. Yes, I'm. Assess a lot, grade a little. 
Assess a lot, grade a little. Thank you. I hope so. How many of you, how many have that on their card? Oh, yes. All right. Okay, don't repeat that one. What's new? Something else somebody's learned. Wait a minute, back here and then you. Yes, and yours. Effective feedback is the key. Effective feedback, yes, good. Thank you, Pat. Feedback raises achievement. Feedback raises achievement, yes. Others. How do we make students accountable without grading their work? Oh, okay, we're getting into questions. Oh, All right. Okay, um, how do we make students accountable without grading their work? Um, one way is to have them redo what um, what they didn't do correctly, okay? And another way, I'm going to get into this in the presentation, so I'll run through a number of slides, but I'm going to go ahead and chase a few of these rabbits right now. Um, one way is to have them redo. Well, how do I have them redo? Because it takes so long and, you know, all that stuff, and it doesn't, and then they're not, uh, they're doing it sloppy work the first time and so forth. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to look at um, uh, the second and third pages of this handout, and I've got some practical strategies for you to use for redo. Um, one, for example, is um, not putting a grade on it, but using a check mark system of some sort. Um, there's a couple of them in here I put on the tips board out there, in fact. One of them is, okay, you've got a set number of criteria for quality work that you've established with your students in the, in the shop, say. So they're working on something, and all you've got to do is put those five or seven, however many criteria there are, on a little strip of paper. You're walking around, you're looking at their work, and it's check if it's plus, if it's great, check, question mark, minus, okay, and hand it to them and say work on criteria number four, which is whatever, getting the dent out of the fender, I don't know, whatever it is that you're working on. Okay, that's a quick way to give assessment, have them work on something they're not working on without putting a grade on it. You know, one of those daily grade kind of things. Another way is, is to make sure, you know, when you grade your, um, what, what is the first thing kids do when, you, when, you, when they get back papers with a grade on it? I mean, one of the first things they do. One of the things they do is play basketball. But what else? Oh, yeah, they compare. They compare, it's kind, of nor, it's kind of norm referencing. We don't ever want to do that. We want criterion referencing. We want, to, we want them to have feedback based on the quality of the work or, the, or how much they've learned, okay? So you, you want to have a rubric, okay, of some sort if you can use. Even a daily rubric, it can be as simple, I've got, I'm going through all these slides so fast, I'm telling you all of them. It can be as simple as a T-chart. You'd establish it with the kids at the, at the beginning of class, in theory or in the lab, what's quality, what's not. It's either there or it's not. And then they can assess them. They can look at it themselves. They can look at it with their colleagues. They can, uh, they can judge each other. So you're get doing that and providing that accountability through some peer assessment as well as individual assess their own assessment. All right? Another way that I put in here so that you get away from that checking to see what somebody else made is a, um, look on the second page in here is a strategy called plus minus, uh, plus equal minus. It is okay for students to, for you to reference a student against his or her own work. It's just not okay to reference their work against somebody else's when you're, when you're using formative assessment. So what's cool about this is the first two strategies on here, three questions and plus equal minus, is that um, even the best student who always gets the A, who always gets the A plus, always perfect, nobody's ever perfect. There's always something you can do to improve your work. So um, with the second strategy, you're putting a plus, a minus, or an equal on it, and what you're saying is this is equal to the work you did the last time, or this is better than you're improving, this is better than the work you did the last time, or it's not as good as the work you did the last time. Works in the shop, works in the, in the classroom, in the theory lab. All right? That way you're being compared against yourself. So a kid that's really kind of low performing can get a plus sometime because they're improving, whereas the high flyer might only get an equal or even a minus because they didn't put as much effort into it the next time around. Does that make sense? But they're getting that formative feedback. Um, the three questions, oh, the, the top flyers hate this strategy. They hate it, hate it, hate it. What you're doing is anybody's work, their paper, if it's a, I'm thinking particularly of a written piece that you might do with students. Um, you go through, or, or math, whatever, you go through and you mark one, two, three, besides three parts of their work. And then at the bottom, you write a question or, 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 or feedback comment about each one of those three things, usually a question. Everybody gets one. Everybody can improve. 
especially in writing assignments, um, when you're doing your writing. Um, and everybody has to do writing, even in career tech. So, um, so you write one, two, three. Everybody has three bits of feedback that they have to respond to for the teacher, whether you're the best student in the class or, or one who's struggling. Okay. It's on every paper. It's right. on every paper. Where you're putting the number is. Just yeah, it's based on whatever that paper is. It's based on whatever that student's work is. Yeah, it's going to be different on everybody's paper. Yeah, it's very individual. Yeah. Point of clarification on the plus equal minus strategy. When you're doing that, are you giving them the same assignment the second time, like if it's a writing prompt? Are they writing on the same topic, or are those two different assignments that they get better on? Yeah, two different assignments. Okay. Two different assignments. It could be the same one, though. Why not? If they made the improvements that you wanted. Um, another one of those strategies, well, I'm, I'm going through the activity I was going to have you do, but is that 50 50 is pretty cool. If you're, if you're really, you really, really are, are, you know, just attached to that grade, give half the grade to start with, give them half the points, and then after they make the corrections, give them the other half the points. So, you know, just some things that work for some teachers, okay? All right. Oh, other questions. I only answered one question there. Oh, my gosh. Other questions that came, yeah. How can we cover content if we are constantly assessing? Uh, because you are covering content while you're constantly assessing. Um, am I covering content with you while I assess? You're, you're, you're giving me some feedback. You're giving me feedback with questions, and I'm responding to that individually. Um, but I'm teaching you what I need to teach you at the same time because it's simultaneous, I guess, is my answer to that. If that I hope that makes sense to whoever asked that question. If it doesn't, see me afterwards and I'll try to help you through that. Other, other question. Thank you for that question. Yes, sir. Great job, motivators for students. That's one of the questions. The other part is how does it narrow the low achievement um, and high achiever gap, especially with ESL students? Okay, grades are only motivators for kids who make good grades. Okay. Um, and they're used to it. And, and the scary part about it is that sometimes even that's not a motivator. Let me tell you why. Because kids get, get to thinking with the grade that it's based on their ability and not their effort. What we really want to stress with kids is that it's, the, it's your effort that makes the difference. We want everybody to keep trying to get better. And if you're constantly getting those A's, then you're afraid to take the risk to try to get better because you might not get better. You might, you might have a lower grade. So in some cases, even for the high-flying kids, a grade is not a motivator because it scares them into, oh, I don't want to take a risk. I don't want to do anything extra hard because then I might get a B, you, you know. Um, so sometimes even that's not a motivator, but it's only a motivator for those who do well. Um, what was the last part of that question? Sorry. Uh, the, how's it narrow the achievement gap? Especially okay. What, what's narrowing the achievement gap is not grades. What's narrowing the achievement gap is giving kids um, effective formative feedback. Let me go forward with this and I'll answer that question, I promise whoever wrote it, in just a minute with some slides, all right? Other questions? One more? No more? All right, we'll move on. Now, who, who was it? Greg, I think it was you, said that you should pre-assess. What was my pre-assessment with you all? The warm-up. It doesn't have to be some big, long, test with a hundred questions on it, you know, that's your unit test at the end. It doesn't have to be something that complicated. It can be very informal. It took one minute plus a minute to discuss and then for us to share out. And I had a very clear sense that most of you knew the difference between formative and summative assessment and some of you had a really good grasp on the continuous nature of formative assessment. Okay? I needed to know that because I don't know any of you all and I've only got an hour with you, right? So that was my pre-assessment. All right, so formative assessment goes on and then the summative. So some pre-assessment strategies, um, I've already covered that. Um, I did a quick writing prompt with you. You could do a KWL. You could just do it with a discussion. Um, you could do it with some student work samples from before, student products. Um, now, what is another pre-assessment that I've done with you all or, or a check for understanding that I've done a couple of times with you all? Very simple, very fast. I just had you shake or nod. 
I just want to know that you're with me, okay? We move forward, and it's it's qu it's quick. It's um, it doesn't slow down the progress of the learning, and at the same time, if I see somebody doing this, you know, it's not threatening, and and I can stop and go back and and check, you know, make a quick correction if I need to. All right, so just a quick shake or nod, um, a thumbs up, thumbs down, some of those things that may seem kind of baby ray, they're really not. They're just as effective with uh, high school kids. So again, you're going to have this PowerPoint either uh, online or with the, with the video or by writing me. So um, we're going to focus on the checking for understanding. This ongoing na nature, how does it go on at the same time so that it doesn't slow down learning? Um, questions, you all talked about that already. Um, now, I'm going to, in case I don't get to this slide later, let me, say, let me chase a rabbit about questions. There's only two reasons for asking a question. One is to cause thinking, and another is to give you information so that you can adjust instruction. Okay? That's why questioning is so important. Do you know the average, average teacher asks 60 questions in a class period? So make them good. All right? It is not the nature of this session, unfortunately, to talk about questioning strategies. I've taken workshops that have lasted all week long, week-long workshops in how to do uh, effective questioning. But the more that you can get everybody involved in asking and answering the question, the more simultaneous participation that you can have, the better off you are. When you beam a question to a group and, um, and you give them a little wait time, wait time one, you give them a little wait time, sing the happy birthday song, teach the kids, if you want a behavior, you've got to teach a behavior. Teach the kids that they're not supposed to do this, that everybody has to have time to think, all right? Seven to 12 seconds, sing happy birthday to yourself. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Eight seconds. It will seem like a lifetime, but resist. That's wait time one. Then ask students to raise their hands, and then you can call on people. Uh, that's wait time one. So effective delivery of questions and effective design of questions, asking them to elicit thinking is very, very important. The design first, then the delivery. All right? Um, but the more simultaneous participation you can have with that, the better off you are. Think pair shares. I ask the question, I give you that seven seconds to think, then you turn to your partner, each partner asks the question to the other one, and each one of them answers it to the other one. Can I hear all of the answers? I can hear some of them because I'm going to be working the crowd. Can I hear all of them? No, of course not. You could argue that that, well you can't hear what they're saying. Well, can you hear what's rattling around in their brains if you're only calling on one kid? No. You're still getting more participation than you did before. So questioning is, is uh, question and answers are critical. All right. Um, what do you already use? I'll take a minute and, and stop and let you all talk for just a second to each other. Let's process a little bit. What kind of checking for understanding do you all use of this list or other things? Uh, share with your partner just a minute. Let's process for just a minute. All right, let's, let's move on. Now this is where I'm going to get into about uh, three or four more minutes of teach. Dick is passing out um, my Lois's famous Ziploc bags. Don't resist. Don't get into them just yet, okay? Resist. Don't look at them. Don't even open them. Listen to me for four more minutes and then we'll play with Ziplocs and little strips of paper. Okay, there are five basic strategies, uh, big categories of strategies that provide effective formative feedback for students. All right, this is out of the research. Um, Dylan and William use three effective strategies. They kind of collapse it, but uh, I'm going to show you the five, no, five strategies, and then I'll show you Dylan and William's three strategies. First of all is clarifying um, the learning intentions. I'm going to go through all of these and then each one of them individually. The second one is the questioning. Classroom, effective classroom discussions and activities that, that elicit evidence, evidence of learning so that you can adjust instruction. Third is feedback that moves kids forward. Fourth is activating learners as resources for one another. That's that peer assessment that we talked about already. And then self-assessment. All right, let's look at a couple of them. Now, Dylan and, and William, um, who began their research in England, and, and now um, Dylan William, I mean Black and William, Dylan, Dylan William, 1L, lives in the United States now. He was, the, I think, one of the big keynote speakers at the High Schools at Work conference um, this past summer. He's, I'm like a groupie of his, okay? Yeah. Um, 
He boils it down even easier to remember for you all. Effective questions, appropriate, appropriate feedback, and then the peer and self-assessment. All right, but I'm going to use the five versions. Um, sh sharing and understanding learning intentions and criteria. Um, in other words, kids have to know what the, what the mark is. They have to know what it is they're learning and why they're learning it so that they know when they're, when they're there. They know when they get there. Um, you, you do that with rubrics. Um, and I, I've already mentioned this, a rubric can be as simple as a T-chart. You say, well, do I have to use a rubric every single day? Well, no, of course not. But something this easy, why wouldn't you? So that you've got a quick check at the end of the class period as to where folks are with it. As part of, maybe make it part of your closure. <coughs> um, here's the thing about rubrics <coughs> that, um, sorry, videotape. I'm coughing into the videotape. Um, here's the thing about rubrics. If you give a kid a rubric at the beginning of the unit, yes, and you go over it, hopefully, then they know what the end mark is. They know what that quality product or project or assignment is, uh, write, piece of writing is supposed to be like. But if you only use it at the end to grade, then you have missed so many opportunities. What you should be doing is using that rubric throughout for formative assessment. At each stage of the game, have them assess themselves, assess their peers on one piece of the rubric, just one little small piece of it. Not necessarily the whole thing, because that's a little overwhelming. But focus on one part of it. Um, and, and have each other um, critique each other, and then learn to critique um, themselves. Oh, there's my quote. Um, don't convert it to a grade until you have to, okay? And then when you do this, and I've worked with so many people where I went, oh my gosh, don't convert a rubric grade into a grade grade. Because if you did, you've got a hundred, you've got a four, three, two, one. You got a hundred, you got a seventy-five, you got a fifty, and you got a you know, zero or twenty-five or whatever, okay? It's not fair. It's not it's not representative of what of what the work was. Remember a four is above grade level or above uh, what you expect. A three is usually at the proficient level, right? And a four is advanced, a two is basic, whatever word you want to use, and then a one is not yet. So, so um, at the mo do it do it by just letter grade. You know, a four is the A or A plus. The at least at proficient, you ought to be at least at a B, right? Um, if you look at the criteria there, it's usually um, at least B work or better. So um, be sure that you don't just base a grade on calculating the percentage of rubric points. In other words, 100, 75, 50, and so forth. Uh, I've known a lot of people that do that, and it's really not, well, obviously, it's not right. So some practical strategies. Um, for um, using rubrics is, uh, or other kinds of ways um, is to have students generate their own test questions. The research shows that students do better when they have been involved in generating the test questions themselves and then um, uh, helping each other to learn those. All right, I've already talked about questioning. Here's some other practical strategies for questioning. No hands up except to ask a question so that you avoid all of this stuff, you know. Um, I don't know that you get that much, but, um, but you know, there's always going to be the one or two that want to answer any, everything. Remember, you got, um, if you're in, in theory lab and you've got kids sitting all around, you're going to have a T zone. Be careful of the T. The kids on the front row and the kids right down the middle are the ones that are going to, um, you're going to, your eyes going to see them. They're going to raise their hands the most. So you want to make sure that all the ones that are out here and out here get called on too. And you don't let them off the hook ever. You can pass the first time around, somebody else answers it, then go back to that person and ask what that person said. Don't let them off the hook. Participation, answering a question is not voluntary. They can get help. All right, I've already talked about wait time one. Wait time two, do you know what that is before I even spend a minute on it? Wait time two is after, and I'm really bad at it. I'm pretty good with wait time one. Wait time two is when the student has answered the question you wait another five to seven seconds before you say anything. You'll be amazed at what happens. They'll kind of look around, and then guess what they'll do? They'll elaborate on their answer, and you get so much more out of them. Okay, so wait time one, wait time two. Practice it with one of your friends because it's really hard to do. Have somebody come in and time you. You know, just sit around and time you when you're doing questions and help them and do the very same thing. 
um, hot seat questions where you've got a hot seat in the class and if you do if you're doing uh, some Socratic kind of things you've got kids in circles leave a hot seat for kids to jump into to ask the question or to talk all right feedback now I don't have enough time to this was the sponge activity that I won't have time to do and I knew I didn't in your packet however you have some strategies for feedback on page four and five I've given you a little worksheet well, I will take one minute on it. Effective feedback is, um, is criterion referenced or self-referenced, never norm referenced. We've already talked about that. It's descriptive. It's very detailed. It's specific. It's clear. It's very respectful in tone to students. Now, I'm going to look at, on the next page, I want you to look at three examples. I've asked you whether that's effective or ineffective feedback. You all do this on your own time. Let me see how many of you really follow up with this. Do this on your own time and then write me and I'll send you the key, okay? Let's see how many of you do it. All right, that's my challenge to you. You've got my email address. All right. Um, let's go down to the fourth one. It's got so pretty obvious. Your report was the shortest one in the class. You didn't put enough in it. Ineffective. First of all, it's norm referenced. It's not detailed. It's not descriptive. I don't know what. It's not based on content. You didn't put enough in it. What does that mean? Okay, so it pretty much none of these criteria match that. Now, um, let's look at um, the sixth one down. Your report is the best one in the class. Also ineffective. And oh my gosh, free homework pass because you happen to have a good paper? No, no, no. All right. Now, I'm going to show you um, uh, the second one and third one. This report probably would not convince a reader who did not already agree that we recycle. What else could you do to make a more convincing argument? Tell me about that. Effective or ineffective? It is effective. It's clinical. Okay? You're, you're saying it wouldn't convince a reader um, who didn't already agree with you, with your point of view. What else could you do to make a more convincing argument? It's respectful. The teacher has asked a question to, pr to get the student thinking about it. It's, dis it's, it's constructive criticism, and it's uh, very respectful because it asks the question. So I think that, now look at the next one. The next one is almost the same thing. This report probably would not convince a reader who did not already agree we should recycle. I would want to know more about the effects on the environment and the cost of recycling. What's the difference between that second one and the third one? I mean, you know, the, what's the difference back here? It gives them something to kind of go off of. It gives them a question to start thinking about so they can flush it out. So yeah. It's telling them that they, they didn't really engage your audience. It's telling them you didn't really engage your audience, but how can you engage them first? And here's two very specific ways that you can add to, your, to the quality of your paper. All right, what's the difference in the students probably uh, who got the second comment and the third comment? What are you picturing? She, the same teacher, same assignment, two different kids. Yeah. I think mean, the second one's probably like a chronic, uh, you know, like a feral, the teacher probably always has to push them. Okay, They're maybe. Like See, I didn't wait time too. I didn't wait. Sorry. Right, like the first one is probably being a better student and the teacher, you know, knows that they're capable of it and wants them to do better. Mm -hmm. Whereas the second one is kind of like, well, once again, you didn't meet the requirements. So here's a couple of specific ways that you can to meet the assignment. What were you going to say? That's what I was going to say is the second one is probably a higher achiever student. The, the third one is a lower achiever and would not be able to figure out those strategies without giving them a... Exactly. Date. To see that how the feedback is scaffolded a little more for the second student than it was for the first one. Okay? So you, you all get it. You get it. Why are you in here? All right. You know. No, you all get it. All right. Let me go through a couple more. Um, I've already talked about the feedback strategies. Um, all right, let's let's play with the little word, the little strips of paper. How many of you know what a word sort is? Ever done a word sort? So I'll take all right. Three of you admit to it. Um, probably more of you do. A word sort is um, a categorization strategy, a classifying strategy. If you know Marzano's um, Power Nine strategies, you know that. Um, categorizing is right up at the top as far as or right near the top in terms of raising student achievement. Kids who know how to 
to sort, to categorize, to classify things, um, do better on um, um, achievement tests. So it, you can have a closed sort or an open sort. A closed sort is when the teacher gives the, kid the, ca the kids the category and they have to sort it according to the, the pre-given categories. An open sort is when you make up your own categories based on what these terms are. How, that requires a little higher level thinking, obviously, to do an open sort, you know, to come up with your own categories. I'm going to suggest a sort for you. And, um, and if you want to do some, another sort, you can. Every one of the little strips of paper in your little Ziploc bag is a formative assessment, can be a formative assessment strategy. I want you to look at them and decide whether you would use that strategy at the beginning of class as part of that pre-assessment or as part of your anticipatory set. In other words, I need to review from yesterday. I need to see where we are from yesterday before I go on with today's lesson, right? Or whether I would use it in the middle of class during the instructional input or the guided practice, or whether I would use it at the end of class for closure to give you that feedback as they're walking out the door. All right, now what questions do you have about your assignment? What if we don't know what the strategy is? Ah, if you don't know what the strategy is, I have a cheat sheet for you in your handout that defines them for you. Now, let me tell you one other thing that I'm going to, I'm going to give you just about four minutes on this, uh, four or five, before we have closure. I'm going to ask you at the very end to tell me a strategy out of all of these that, um, that we've talked about this hour. It could be from the word sort, it could be from the redo strategies that you are carrying out the door that you will commit to using on Monday morning. All right? You can't remember all of these, otherwise you just go out with one eye rolling one way and one eye rolling the other. But you can commit to one or two of them, right? All right. Get with your partner, triad or partner, and sort beginning, end, or beginning, middle, or end of class. So we've got um, three minutes left. I cannot get verbal feedback from everybody in here, but I want you to reflect for um, maybe 15 seconds. I'll, I'll tell you when to talk. I want you to look back, look back through the strategies, I want you to commit. We're going to have closure and commitment in our last three minutes. Closure and commitment. Yes, Mama Lois. Closure and commitment. I, I want you to select two strategies that you think you will use, try to use next week. Don't worry about whether you use them well or not. Uh, we were talking at the back of the room here about, um, oh, I know some of these strategies. I used to use them, and I stopped using them. It's kind of a habit. You have to use things till you become good at them, and they become kind of part of your instructional routine. So you're going to you know, not do well at it sometimes. Two strategies. All right, think, and then turn to your partner and share. OK, now somebody want to share with me in our last few seconds? Give me a little feedback. What are you going, what are you going to try next week? Okay, good. Thank you for that. Um, I was going to say press conference. It's, as, as an administrator, um, our big focus this year is really on students' intellectual engagement in the classroom, like how do we measure that and helping teachers support that. So if we have in this press conference strategy, teachers having students ask the questions and then it gets them more engaged in hoping that their question is called and having a dialogue about what that topic is. And Great. Great, thank you for that. You're going to share it with lots of people. I'm real thrilled about that. All right, I've run out of time. I'm past time. Um, there is an evaluation form. On the last page of your handout, I won't ask you to do it, but there's outcome sentences. It's a great closure strategy for, that inc includes a little bit of quick write. Um, I was going to have you do it for me, but keep it for yourself as a, another strategy to use, and um, I'll turn it back over to Dick. Thank you all for your time. <laughs>